Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Pound your weekly review, the podcast that I know a lot of you care about, especially the OG 200 that joined at 11 p.m. on a Friday night when you could be doing anything else or listening to the three guys talk about Palantir. We were not able to do it last night on Friday. Uh, Chris and such, and they just were not able to make it last night. We will be back next week, but I did want to do a weekly review of my own uh, to talk about some of the things that have happened with Palantir. There are three major things that happened this week. I did an article of each of them on dailypalantir.com. I want to quickly review them and give you your sort of weekly recap of what's happened in the world of Palantir. Now, before I get into that, one quick uh, little announcement for me. Uh, dailypalantir.com, my website where that's curating kind of hopefully the best content on the internet around Palantir. It's not going to get all the search traffic that Seeking Alpha or Motley Fool are going to get, but I think in time as Google sees that site as an authoritative source that actually is analyzing the company in a meaningful way uh, and reporting on the news, then that will start to get some search traffic leading back to that website. So it's a fun journey building that website. We do a weekly newsletter every Thursday. I am officially making that daily, which means I'm upgrading and paying the hosting service whatever amount of money they want a month so that they can actually send that many thousands of emails a month because that is expensive to do it's not cheap um, because I think it, it, it's time to do it daily there's enough news to cover about Palantir to the point where every day I'm overwhelmed thinking what stuff should I cover and then some stuff doesn't get covered some stuff does get covered what a daily newsletter forces you to do really psychologically and my newsletter has five articles every day is pick the best five articles put them in like 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 a, a place where they can be seen daily and then actually distribute those and then move on to the next day versus have you know Monday's news go to Friday it, it kind of gives me a more structure and more schedule and we just passed about a thousand signups on that newsletter um, and I think people actually care about having daily updates on it so that will be launching a link in the description if you want to subscribe it's totally free there really is not a plan to charge for this ever my goal is to get more distribution not like charge people money just to just to access the news especially when you get access the news from anywhere I'm so grateful that people care about accessing it from my perspective so if you want to sign up for that uh, uh, please feel free to sign up for daily updates starting this Monday. Biggest news of the week, I would say, is Palantir selected to build the Titan program competitive prototype. So Palantir is in the running for a $36 million contract. From the press release, they announced today, it is one of two companies, them and Raytheon, awarded a prime contract by the Army to build a prototype for the Tactical Intelligence Targeting Access Node program. Now, the real uh, couple pieces of analysis here in the article was that Palantir once sued the government. The only reason Palantir is actually able to fight for this contract, which is what Alex Karp talked about in his interview that we're going to talk about in a second this week in Switzerland, was because they sued the government. The government used to have a horrible procurement mechanism to actually find technology companies. It was like this archaic method of, of sourcing uh, vendors and then like non-technical people trying to evaluate the technology. It was just all political and it didn't make any sense. Palantir sued the government. The government lost that case and then they had to start picking the best technology from a meritocratic perspective. And if we know anything about Palantir, it probably has the best tech in the world when it comes to the software stuff. So Palantir was actually able to uh, win some of this stuff, and that was really good for Palantir. So as a result of that happening that many years ago, they now have these contracts where they're actually able to compete and show off that their technology has a chance to win. Now, the next piece of analysis here is that Palantir wants to be the first prime software contractor. Look, being a prime contractor for the government is incredibly lucrative because it means you're the first person they go to when they need to develop a new technology. There are five prime contractors, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon Technologies. It's very difficult to get these prime contracts. Uh, and you have to have a really, really good relationship with the government and you've got to show them that you can execute. Now, to be the first software prime contractor, which would be the sixth overall prime contractor for software, people have said is damn near impossible. I mean, this stuff is really difficult to do. Palantir has an ambition to do this. If there was any software company in the world that could do this, it would be Palantir. Uh, and their ability to do this means they have endless opportunities to work with more governmental agencies. They have a precedent for European nations to want to work with them because they're a prime contractor for the world's you know greatest democracy, the United States. And they will get larger deals and be able to build more unique Governmental product. So I think this is a very, very big deal for Palantir. We're going to see if they end up winning this uh, competitive race against Raytheon Technologies, and we'll see over time. And uh, if they are able to do that, then that would be pretty awesome. Next piece of big news this is on Monday. Palantir launched a new partnership to secure more governmental deals. So they launched a partnership with a consulting firm called Guidehouse. Guidehouse, Guidehouse has 12,000 employees, and they are 50 50 split between public and private sector clients in their uh, clientele list. Now, the consulting firm partnership is not something unique for Palantir. They've done this many times in the past. Uh, they've worked with Accenture. They've worked with Jacobs Engineering. They just launched a partnership with Google, which is essentially you know launching them as a platform to get multi-channel distribution into getting more clients. So partnering with consulting firms to Palantir seems to be this like running theme of, okay, consulting firms have the clients. We don't have a great sales force. If they can recommend our product to the clients, the clients can automatically access our uh, you know, potential deals are our software, our product. They can try us out. We have a chance to close them, which means we get to get more business. Under the PR, the agreement says Guidehouse will architect solutions across the public sector customer base by building on Palantir's Foundry platform to accelerate business processes, rapid image product delivery, AI model training, 
and enterprise data integration. Now, the key uh, word here is public sector customer base. So Palantir is not using them to get more commercial or private clients. Palantir is like, hey, you work with a bunch of public governmental agencies. We want more of that revenue. That revenue is sticky. We know we're the best you know, software contractor for governments in the world. So we want more access to that. Uh, so this agreement at the end of the day is a really, really powerful combination. Again, I like this because the goal of these alliances is to make sure more clients have the ability to discover a platform like Foundry. Peter Thiel, co-founder of Palantir, said a good product with zero distribution is a bad product. If you can't get people to know about the product, the product doesn't matter at the end of the day. Uh, so that was the second pretty much biggest news of the week. And then we have on Twitter, I'm not going to show you the entire thing, but Alice Carp did a 53 minute interview that I'm still reacting to. I'm still breaking up. Pounder Vision, uh, Jackson, his channel did an awesome super cut of that for 17 minutes. I would highly recommend checking that out. Um, Squawk Box, CNBC, uh, uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin did an interview with uh, uh, Alex Carp at this at the Aspen's Big Idea Festival in Switzerland. And here's a clip of him talking about how his trip was meeting the Ukrainian president. Here this month, Karp became the first Western CEO to visit Ukraine and meet directly with President Zelensky. Given Karp's understanding of the technology that both Russia and Ukraine have and the work that he's doing for the country of Ukraine, I asked him how he thinks this war is going to play out. I believe a lot of what will happen will come down to the health of, uh, of the president. Like, I, I don't want to reduce, you know, a lot of times, obviously, you have you look at things from the prism of what you've done. And in tech, in general, you can reduce the company to the founding team. Doesn't mean a great founding team will win, but any idea will not work without a founding team that's creative and interesting and, and has business acumen. So I, I'm very indexed on him. Perhaps one of those concerning things he said, and he reiterated something he said to us in Davos just last month, is his worry about a nuclear war and the possibility that the longer this goes on, the greater the chances for what he describes as a mistake. We talked about that. And there's more they talked about in that interview. So I thought that was a great interview. I'll be reacting to that. I'll be offering a lot of thought pieces and ideas that I have on that in my newsletter as well. Uh, so you guys can check that out. So big, big week for Palantir. Uh, they were able to do a public interview with the CEO for 53 minutes. Gave a lot of thoughts on his ideas. It's always nice to hear uh, Palantir's Alex Karp say, I quote, I am very bullish on Palantir. I mean, when you listen to him speak about it, again, it, it's not like trying to get mesmerized or anything. It's just trying to get what does the founder, as he said, the, the technology company usually comes down to the founder and their ability to be creative and have business acumen and get people in the world to care about their product. How is he thinking about the product? Some founders are not that inspirational. And it's not about being inspirational and not backing it up with product. It's about, hey, can you articulate a way or a trajectory for me to understand your thought process? And then are you executing against that thought process? And can you explain that execution? And I think he did a wonderful job really breaking that stuff down uh, in that interview. So that the guide house deal and the deal to potentially build this army or to build this army prototype and potentially get chosen for this additional 36 million dollar contract uh that was your weekly news update for palantir me chris and Sachin will be back next week uh and we will be talking more and more around some of the stuff that's happening thank you guys so much for listening thank you so much for watching hope you guys enjoy subscribe daily palantir newsletter in the description daily palantir updates every single day not sure what time yet but there's going to be every single day a newsletter uh in your email and i hope you guys sign up thank you so much for watching listening i'll see you on the next one